Ladies and gents, welcome to this latest staff tip. Right from the beginning of people telling me to make a YouTube channel, I've wondered how the hell I can make some of these tech features that I do for magazines and on the staff tech website into YouTube videos, as frankly they're all pictures and words. Thankfully my friend Dan Joyce, who you may know as a professional lunatic on Dirty Sanchez back in the day on MTV, is now a professional filmmaker and a really good one at that and he happened to show me an example of how this is done so this my friends is my first attempt at this also I want to give credit to Billy Sutton yes that's him standing on Father Ted's wall in that picture he's Irish so that's the equivalent of going to God's house as well back he asked me my opinion on the engine this video is actually about and up until he asked me about it I'd never even heard of it to be fair Billy struggled to find any real info on the engine barring basic power levels and rev limits and when I had a look, there was very little interesting info out there at all as well. But I did find lots of good pictures. And after a good 15 years of messing about and writing about engines full time, I've got a pretty good idea of what I'm looking at. And thankfully, with these great pictures, I'm able to talk to you about this engine, which is a brand new 2018 Formula 2 turbo engine. Well, it's not a road car engine, and a lot of modern race engines are pretty irrelevant to us tuning fans. This one's got a whole lot of aspects that are totally relevant to us. What we have here is a 3.4 litre 24 valve V6 engine made by French company Mechachrome, who despite sounding like one of the Transformers, are actually a world class race engine builders who built the Renault Formula 1 engine since the 1980s turbo era, and that was back when Renault were the pioneers of turbocharged engines. So it's fair to say Mechachrome know exactly what they're doing when it comes to turbos. As you probably noticed, it's a billet block and head like so many engines these days. And this engine in particular is said to make 620 horsepower at 8,500 RPM. And it says it makes 400 pound foot, but it doesn't mention the RPM. But looking at the rest of the car, I'd suggest it's somewhere around 6.5 to 7 grand it makes 400 pound foot. And it's got a rev limit, they say, of 8,750. An engine like this isn't made for low RPM performance purely as in racing the engine will never actually be down there. So it would be totally pointless. But despite this it's likely to make within 10% of peak torque from maybe around 5,500 RPM all the way to the rev limiter. A 620 brake at 8,500 RPM equates to just over 380 pound foot i.e. not far off peak torque. So it's certainly not dropping off so it's actually got a very wide rev range. As a comparison, I've seen NA 3.4 litre race engines that make 500 brake make all the way up at 9,500 RPM, but only make 310 pound foot of torque, a very high, in comparison at least, 7,500 RPM, so nowhere near the power band of this engine. Being turbocharged, even though going by the power figures it's like to be running well under one bar of boost, gives it a much wider power band and much more torque than naturally aspirated race engines of a similar capacity. On to details of the engine. One of the big things that stands out, and the one thing I've actually got no real answers for, is what the hell is that tailpipe about? Is it just for looks? Is it to stop rabbits living inside the exhaust? Or is it some kind of catalyst, as emissions is as much of a thing in modern motorsports as on road cars, to be honest? Now one of the things I do actually understand. As you can see, the inlet and exhaust ports are reversed from the usual layout, so the exhaust is in the V, and the inlet manifold's on the outside of the engine. This isn't a new setup, with Ford using this setup right back in the 60s on a race engine and I actually did a stab tech feature on the Ferrari Formula 1 turbo engine in the 1980s which also had a similar spec. Even on production cars these days it's becoming more popular with both BMW and Mercedes doing this setup in recent years on V8 engines. Another thing that's pretty clear to see, externally at least, is the inlet manifold design. These look to be made of carbon fibre and are a pretty conventional design for a turbo inlet manifold. This arrow was pointing at the fuel injectors, which at first glance seemed like conventional port injection, but looking at the angle and position of them, it seems the engines run in direct injection, which would tally up with almost all new conventional engine designs. This next arrow is pointing at the motor for the drive-by-wire throttles, and yes, that's throttles. Individual throttle bodies per cylinder. As it's a purpose-built race engine, Rather than being part of the inlet manifold, it looks like they've been built directly into the heads themselves. Going by the curve of the metal right by the inlet port, I'd go as far as to say they're a roller barrel design rather than a conventional flat throttle plate, which means there's zero restriction at full throttle. This next picture is one of the most descriptive of them all, showing everything already mentioned, but also the very cool turbo setup, which is twin entry, twin scroll, and with twin internal wastegates. The 
big arrows here are pointing to the two inlets and the twin scroll turbine housing, one for each bank of the V, and the smaller arrows are pointing to the external actuator arms of the twin internal wastegates, with one at the top, one at the bottom, basically one for each scroll. This front view is another great pick, and the lack of heat shields on this shows the exhaust manifold design very well, and the fact that the manifold collector is actually nowhere near the turbine inlets, which goes against pretty much what everyone believes is the best way to do turbo manifolds. The next thing it shows, and what all these smaller arrows point to, is all the exhaust gas temperature probe ports. One on each runner and one after each collector. EGT sensors are a good and quite simple way of telling if any cylinder is running hotter than any other, which can indicate running lean or an ignition problem or much more, which obviously on a race engine where long term reliability is key, is a very important factor. Next up on the picture, just in case you didn't believe me earlier, the two wastegate actuators for the twin internal wastegates. The turbo itself is an unusual one and made by a turbo manufacturer you've probably never heard of and their name is Van der Lee Turbo Systems. No, that's not the 70s TV show Van der Valk, not the goalkeeping legend Van der Saar, but Van der Lee. Every time I've seen this engine on display, it's always had a dodgy eBay looking cone filter mounted on the compressor in there, almost like they didn't want to show us what's behind it on the compressor itself. And with the exhaust fitted, of course, you can't see the turbine outlet flange either. But lo and behold, as I'm pretty good like that, I found the pictures. It's entirely possible all the turbo components are designed from scratch by Van der Lee. The housings certainly are bespoke to this application. I must admit that compressor wheel looks like a Borg Warner S300 one to me. If you're wondering what the code is near the compressor out there, it says ALSI9MG, which is actually the chemical designation for cast aluminium. This picture of the turbine side is pretty cool to see, as it shows the twin internal wastegates. Twin internal wastegates exist on other turbos, but they are rare, and I've certainly never seen one mounted each side of the turbine wheel like this one. Also again, while it's entirely possible the wheels on this turbo are all bespoke, that turbine wheel again looks a lot like a Borg Warner one to me. This side view adds fuel to the fire that the turbo is more of a hybrid turbo made from other parts rather than a completely bespoke one, and that's because it has water ports on the side of the core, albeit not hooked up. This isn't the terrible thing that many people think it is, and on production cars converted to race or rally cars, this is the norm. The reason is, on journal bearing turbos, water cooling serves no real purpose on a race engine, and the water pipes just add another potential reliability problem, to be honest. Another thing on this side view that makes me think it's a production-based turbo isn't easily visible, but it's a logo near the flange for the turbine housing that you may just about be able to see. It looks like a three-pointed star within a circle, almost like a Mercedes logo. Mercedes use a lot of Borg Warner turbos on their various engines, especially commercial engines which would be using turbos around about this size, but again I'm just speculating now. Just in case you think that water cooling port wasn't hooked up on the picture we just shown because of the display engine, check out this picture of the complete Formula 2 car. Yep, it's still not hooked up as like I say, water cooled cores serve no real purpose on a race engine apart from some BB core turbos, and I'd almost be inclined to say this is a journal bearer one. You know what else is interesting about this fully installed pick? Yep, silicone hoses and normal Jubilee style hose clamps. While the internet and sales teams at your local fancy clamp manufacturer might tell you the best thing ever to use is a £50 shiny clamp for each fitting, think logically, this car is a multi-million pound, carbon fibre everything, billet block, it's got electronics worth more than most of our entire cars, but they use silicone hoses and Jubilee style hose clamps. Why would they do that? It's not to save money, it's not for any reason barring they are the most effective and reliable solution to this engine, to this race engine, to almost any turbocharged engine. To be Decent hose clamps and silicone hose are 100% reliable even at 30 psi plus boost in my experience. And unlike these fancy rigid fittings everyone gets excited over, they have enough flex and movement, which is what happens with heat expansion and with a hard used car. Things do move and flex and expand. Rigid fittings might not leak when subjected to a static pressure test, but when subjected to the rigours of racing, the odds of them leaking even for a moment is high, and that's why 99% of proper works race cars run at least some flexible silicone hose, even in Formula 1. The final installed pick shows something else very interesting. The hoses are actually SFS ones, a UK company most of us will have heard of. It's not 100% clear, but it looks like the intercooler is a double layer twin pass design where the air enters one core, travels to the other side, goes down a layer to the second core, back across again, and out the intercooler towards the engine. 
in some respects, some people may, may say that sounds restrictive, but if these guys can use it, it clearly isn't as restrictive as some people think. We're getting near the end of this feature, but let's have a look at the exhaust. Not like there's much of it. The exhaust looks to be at least 1.25 times as big as the turbine wheel its juice diameter, which is the accepted minimum for a performance turbo exhaust size. And going by pictures where you can compare it to other parts of the car and even the people standing around the engine, it's clearly big. At least 4 inch diameter the exhaust, maybe even 5 inch. If we guess at 4 inch and 1.2 times the exhaust diameter, that would make the turbine wheel spec similar to a typical turbo capable of around the, well, around the 1000 horsepower mark. Things like Garrett GT42s, EFR 9180s, or something like a Holset HX55. This makes sense for a low boost turbo on that size engine, making around about 620 brake. The final thing worth noting on the exhaust is the big and smooth bends from either side where the wastegates are. You do see some downpipes, the standard Subaru Impreza ones are probably the most famous example of this, where there's very little fault for flow from the wastegate, and this plays a big part into why that downpipe is so restrictive. But safe to say this exhaust is pretty much perfect from that perspective. And that, my friends, is about it. I'd love to know more on this engine, but just like most other race engines, there's very little public info out there, especially correct info. And what I've shown and told you here is like to be more detailed than anything else they've publicly released of other engines or anything to go by. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this feature and thought it went well. Similar features I've done on the Stabtech website in conventional written form have been hugely popular, and make sure you check them out. And hopefully my farmer accent hasn't been too hard to understand while checking this out. Be sure to check out my previous videos and there will be a lot more regular tech and tuning videos from now on. Mostly in conventional video form, but maybe if this video goes down well with you guys, we'll see more like this also. Either way, please subscribe to the Stabtech channel to see much more. Thanks as ever for your support and you'll see more from me soon. Cheers.